Hey everybody, welcome back to Hoffman Reproductions. Thank you for tuning in with us again today. This is going to be part two in our series of Introduction to Flintlock Shooting. You recall on our last segment we discussed how to go about procuring a flintlock, how to make the decisions in order to get you the type of firearm that you want, and also we covered the shooting bag and powder horn. On this segment we're going to go over the basic loading and shooting components that you will need. I say basic because there's a huge variety of tools and accoutrements out there to choose from so I just covered the basics. But uh, before we get into that we're going to talk about a necessary item you are going to have in order to load and fire your flintlock and it is this. Black powder. Now, up until now, this would have been what I recommend that you go out and get, and this is a tried and true brand Go-X Black Pure Black Powder. However, as anyone knows that is involved with muzzle loading and shooting, uh, this company is currently for sale and no longer producing black powder. This has been the mainstay for a lot of shooters for a number of years, and unfortunately, as we've covered in past videos, they are going to be closing their doors unless a buyer uh, comes forward and purchases that company. Um, it is by no means the only choice of black powder that is out there. There is also Swiss brand black powder and German black powders. They are more premium powders and they are a bit more expensive, but they work excellent in flintlock firearms. Again, it's unfortunate, it's a bad time to kind of get into muzzle loading because um, everybody is sort of afraid you won't be able to get it so they're buying it up and a lot of places are currently sold out of it or it is very difficult to get until the supply comes back up it can be a little bit difficult to procure right now um, you all know my thoughts on that if you're new to our channel it may come as a surprise but those of you that follow us know that I'm involved in making my own homemade black powder and uh, I'll stick with that regardless of what happens in the commercial industry. Um, however, black powder is what I would recommend that you use in a flintlock. Some guys will use Pyrodex and prime with black powder, and if uh, you want to do that, of course, that's up to you. I purchased a couple of cans of Pyrodex when I very first got into muzzleloading over 20 years ago, and after I used it up I got uh, genuine black powder and I've never gone back since. I prefer it and it is what I recommend. However, to each his own. So um, as far as black powder you'll notice if you can see that or not, it comes in different size granules, okay? There is 1F, 2F, 3F, and 4F are the tip typical sizes and each size is used for a dedicated caliber. Uh, 1F is good for roughly 50 caliber on up. Your large muskets will use this, your military guns. Uh, 2F is usually 50 caliber on up as well. You can get a little bit different performance out of that. Some guys prefer it. 3F is typically used for 45 caliber and under. And there's a lot of technical information I could give you on that, but just to say um, that's the general consensus when shooting those powders. That's what they're designed for. Some guys will prefer a finer or a coarser powder for a certain type of caliber. Um, a lot of guys love to shoot 3F because you can prime with 3F. It works very good. Um, as opposed to say 1F which can be a little precarious when priming with it. But that's the general rule as far as caliber to granule size and there are ballistic reasons why it has been designed for that. So again, experiment. Uh, see what your particular firearm likes. If it likes a larger powder or a finer powder. You do not want to load with 4F. That is a dedicated priming powder and you really would not be happy with the results if you put a full charge of 4F down the barrel of a gun. So that is the uh, 10 cent spiel on black powder. So we're going to go ahead next and head on up to the shop and cover some of the loading accoutrements and also go over the various fine points of a flintlock. That's up next. Okay, so I'm going to take you guys on a quick little tour of a standard flintlock just to show some of the parts in case some of you are relatively new to them and some of the terms maybe don't make much sense to you. But here we have a Davis Colonial English lock 
uh, the type that were produced from the 1720s on up into the 1760s approximately. Uh, popular well-made flintlock nowadays. But uh, the basic parts are the frizzen spring. This controls the tension on the frizzen. The frizzen which is here. A hardened piece of steel that the flint when secured in the jaws will strike and cause a spark. We have the pan. This little recessed area in here is where the priming is put that when uh, detonated will ignite the main charge. We have the hammer here or cock as it was known in the 18th century. Bottom jaw, top jaw, and the top jaw screw which can be adjusted to securely clamp the flint within the jaws. Uh, the lock plate is here. On the inside we have the mainspring which generates the tension to cause the lock to function. We have the bridle underneath of it and you can't really see some of these parts but we have the tumbler which has a corresponding half cock full cock notch. This little guy here is the sear. When that is tripped with the trigger it causes the gun to fire, the trigger to let loose or the cock I mean we have the sear spring here. And that's the basic parts of a flintlock, just in case some of our viewers were wondering what the actual names of them were. For those of you that already know that, well, nothing new. Now, one thing you're going to need, obviously, to shoot a flintlock is flint. And it is clamped in the jaws of the cock when the frizzen is lowered. When that is full cocked, do not fire it without flint or wood in there, by the way. You will damage it. The cock falls forward. The flint strikes the frizzen, knocking it open. A shower of sparks hits the priming. The priming goes in and ignites the main charge. Now, in order to get the flint lock to do that, you have to have flint, of course. And in the United States nowadays, there are three different types of flint that are primary primarily used. You have a black English flint, very popular. A French amber flint, also used quite a bit. And then the Texas and Kentucky chert type flints are used quite a bit. Uh, each lock uses a slightly different size. You want to match your flint to the size of your lock and most manufacturers have a little guide that will tell you the approximate or appropriate size that you want to use. My personal favorite, although these all will work great, is actually the shirt. I found that for my personal flintlocks that works the best. A little more difficult to get. These two are a little more readily available. You kind of have to look around to find a small private supplier of those, but I really like the Texas or Kentucky shirt type flints. They work good. And then also, you'll notice they have a bevel, and that sharp bevel will go forward. Um, you need to experiment with your flint lock, and I'm going to show you how to set up a flint in your lock on uh, upcoming videos. There's different ways that you can do it, but we'll cover that during the actual loading and shooting. But obviously, you can put it down or facing up, and some locks will work better one way or the other, so you have to experiment. In order to hold the flint in the jaws of the cock, leather is typically utilized, thin strip of leather, wraps around the flint like so, and then you can securely clamp it in the jaws of the flint lock by using a screwdriver. Uh, leather typically used, sometimes lead is used, a strip of lead. The only problem with lead is it can work loose, whereas leather it's a little more sponge-like, so that works well to grip the flint. So that's the uh, quick rundown on flints, and we'll get set up for the next segment here. Okay, so these are the basic accoutrements that I use to shoot and load my flintlock rifle. Starting here on the left, we have an adjustable brass powder measure. It is adjustable from 5 to 120 grains. I don't carry this in my pouch typically. I have a fixed measure that's a period correct one. 
Uh, this is nice though for when getting a new rifle, say you want to play with the powder charge or if you have different loads for target shooting versus hunting, it's nice to have an adjustable measurer. This also gives you the option to be able to measure powder charges when making your own powder charger, but a uh, good tool to have, and if you don't have one, you're new to flintlock shooting or muzzle loading, I recommend that you get a good uh, adjustable measure. This is not a period correct one, but it does get the job done and is useful for the reasons stated. This is not also a period correct version, but it's a combination tool that has a screwdriver on one end, flint napping hammer, because you do need to be able to sharpen your flints, we'll cover that process more later during the shooting, and a vent pick should the touch hole become clogged. Again, there are period correct versions of this available on the market. I have a little leather bag that I carry, and I carry clean uh, patches in this for swabbing out the bore or tow if you want to be period correct and then in conjunction with that I have a tow worm and a brass cleaning jag. This is the period correct version again used in conjunction with tow to scrub out the barrel and clean it swab in between shots threads into your ramrod and then you wrap a wad of tow around it. Again we'll demonstrate this stuff during the shooting stage the modern version cleaning jag which threads onto the end of your ramrod used for the same purpose only with cleaning patches this particular item is controversial as far as being historically correct for the 18th century some say they exist some say they do not um, if I'm not involved in a reenactment or some sort of living history event and I'm just shooting for fun, I carry a couple of these. And this holds the patched round ball already set to go. And all you have to do is push it down into the gun. Really speeds up the loading process. I'll usually carry a couple of these again if I'm just shooting for fun or by myself or whatever and uh, doesn't need to meet any type of a, type of a historical background. I have a small bullet pouch that I've made. This holds my 45 caliber ammunition. It just has a squeeze throat so there's no stopper. And that holds the round balls that I use. You may want to get a pick and whisk set. This is just a simple one that hangs on my shooting bag. The pick of course is used to clear out the vent should it become clogged the brush portion to clear away the fouling from the pan and around the flash hole. Nice to have. You may want a knife. I always carry a pocket knife in my shooting bag. Um, I don't cut patches with it, however a lot of guys do. They like to keep their patching in long strips on their shooting bag and use a knife. Uh, after they press the bullet down in to cut it free. Some of them will have a little fixed knife. Maybe they'll carry on a shooting bag strap for that purpose. Uh, again, I don't. I don't like messing with them. I like pre-cut patches. But a lot of guys do, so I do have a knife in my bag. Of course, you're going to need round balls for muzzle loading, soft lead. And when we say soft lead, you should be able to press in with your fingernail and make a small cut. That's the softness that you're going for. Of course, the appropriate size uh, to match the weapon that you're firing. Uh, usually, let's say for instance, you have a 50 caliber rifle. If you go under that a bit, say .490, that's a good place to start. And then, of course, your patching will take up the extra room. But one of the neat things about muzzle loading is you can play with the size and the patching a lot to get the load combo you want. You may want to go uh, easier loading, looser fit, or tighter loading. You just have to experiment and see what your rifle prefers. Um, you can of course buy lead round balls in different sizes. Black powder supply companies offer them. Or you can get into casting and it is a far cheaper option. I got into casting my own a long time ago and all the ammunition that I fire is hand cast lead round balls. Patching, which is used in conjunction with the round ball, 
is what is put over the muzzle, the round ball put on top, and then it pushed down, and it takes up the space around the bullet for a tight fit. Uh, when using or choosing patching, make sure it is an all-natural material. In other words, either 100% cotton, 100% linen, or a combination of those two. This is a pillow ticking patching, tight cloth weave. This is a linen section of patching. Uh, you don't want synthetics or blends type material for use as patching because they will melt in the barrel of your firearm and create not quite a nasty sticky mess. So make sure they're all natural. Uh, you can buy this patching from supply houses, both linen and cotton, pillow ticking. Uh, comes in different thicknesses, uh, different cuts. You can get them round or square. You can get them pre-greased and we're going to cover uh, greases in the next video when we talk about shooting. Um, but the way that I buy it, and the cheapest way, is just go to your local fabric store. Uh, pillow ticking is always there if you want that, or whatever type of uh, material you're looking for, as long as it's canvas or linen. And you can buy a whole yard of it for just a few dollars and get literally hundreds and hundreds of shots out of the fabric. And, uh, of course, a very cheap way of doing that. You want to make sure you wash it when you bring it home from the fabric store because it can have sizing added to the material, which is uh, not what you want going down the barrel of a firearm. But uh, that's how I go about getting my patching. And, again, a lot more on load combinations and whatnot in our next video. But that's the basic list of accoutrements that I use. You will notice I do not have a short starter. Uh, more on that in the next video, but I do not use a short starter. I have it for a number of years and have gotten along just fine without one. So uh, that's the list of basic accoutrements or a showcase of the basic accoutrements that I use to load and fire my flintlock rifle. All right, everybody, well, that's going to do it for today's video. On our next segment, we are going to cover the actual loading and firing of a flintlock and uh, film some targets being shot downrange here. And then after that, we'll be covering the cleaning. So everyone, please have a very happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you all again real soon. Bye now.